this festival is a gathering place. Um, artists are gathered, art is gathered and shared with an audience for the first time. And um, there's a landscape of meaning making and context um, that goes with that. And this is part of it, uh, that you are making sense of the world and you've come to engage with other people who are doing the same. And I love the fact that these conversations and uh, the films on screen and the work that we're encountering coexist, they're creating something. We don't know what it will be yet, but they're creating something that will, will go out into the world. Um, I'm Tabitha Jackson. I'm the director of the uh, documentary film program at Sundance. Thank you. I can't believe I had to look at my notes to remember my own name, but that's <laughs> where we are in the, in the festival. And this incredible conversation is hosted by our beloved John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Um, our organizations have uh, a couple of things in common, not least is the shared destination of a healthy, independent media landscape. <clears throat> we see that as being vital to a healthy, wider culture uh, and society. Um, and in a piece recently, Lauren Pabst um, talked about the possibility of journalism and documentary to create a space for change. And that's very similar language to the language that we at Sundance use to talk about what we hope to do is to create a space for imaginative possibility. What the support of the MacArthur Foundation for us has, uh, has done is to enable us as an organization uh, to have a space for imaginative possibility. It's been incredibly valuable, this partnership. And since 2009, the MacArthur Foundation has enabled us to support non-fiction, new media storytellers through our documentary, New Frontier, and indigenous programs, with an emphasis on projects that take creative risks, which is I'm a big fan of, hold truth to power, who doesn't want to do that, and elevate voices from communities across the United States. Obviously, we all want to be doing that and need to do more of it. Um, but there's something uh, else less tangible that this partnership has brought to us. And we have worked most closely with Kathy Im and Lauren Pabst. Um, and it's been an incredible thing. And the two things that they have brought to us are uh, allyship and inspiration. Inspiration in the way that they so thoughtfully and rigorously look at the landscape of independent media and ask not what can artists do to improve this landscape, but ask us as institutions and most notably themselves in a transparent, continuous, rigorous way, what can we do to play our role in this, in progressing this landscape and from their their incredibly progressive thinking about general operating support to constantly asking themselves how they can do better and asking us what we need to do better. Um, it's, it's a very inspirational organization. Allyship in the way that uh, Kathy and Lauren uh, have engaged with us as we try to support artists in the best way we can. Um, making sure that, the, that bureaucracy and hierarchy and the traditional relationships between grantors and grantees don't get in the way of the work and the vision. And it has enabled us to do things that we would not previously have been able to do. I think um, the other thing that we share, and I think everybody in this room shares, is something I like to quote from Martha Graham, the, the dancer, this notion of blessed unrest she talks about a, dis a divine dissatisfaction, a blessed unrest that keeps us marching and makes us more alive than the others. There's something in all art, I think, but particularly in the non-fiction world, in journalism and documentary in which we swim, but that blessed unrest is the key uh, to progress. So we, l we love Kathy and Lauren, we love the MacArthur Foundation. And today's conversation, centering on the question, uh, what if 
what we call history was editable. I was thinking about that when I woke up this morning and thought I would like to edit my own history and have one less Manhattan and one more hour's sleep. So I'm very keen to engage in this conversation. <laughs> it may not focus on that, but in a time where disinformation is easily spread, dominant narratives contradict lived realities of so many communities across the world, and political discourse becomes increasingly polarized. Our field needs MacArthur Foundation and allies and inspirations like them. So without further ado, um, I would like to hand over uh, the rest of this conversation to our beloved colleague and friend, Lauren Pabst. Tabitha, thank you so much for that generous and inspiring introduction. And I just want to say that on behalf of the MacArthur Foundation Journalism and Media Program, uh, we're so grateful for the relentless inspiration and creativity um, and courage of uh, organizations like the Sundance Institute and all of the institutions that we're really proud and privileged to support. Um, so before we begin, we would like to pay our respects to the ancestral keepers of the land we are on today, the Ute Tribal Nation, and we thank them for allowing us to be here. Um, so I am Lauren Pabst. I'm a senior program officer for journalism and media at the MacArthur Foundation. And MacArthur's journalism and media program supports the creation of accurate, just, and inclusive news and narratives that inform, engage, and activate people in the United States to build a more equitable future. And the MacArthur Fellows Program supports and honors exceptional individual creativity across disciplines. So it is our great honor on behalf of the Journalism and Media Program and the Fellows Program to host this afternoon's conversation featuring five extraordinary storytellers whose collective work spans the disciplines of, I've got a list, journalism, scholarship, documentary filmmaking, historical fiction, graphic novels and comic books, virtual reality, interactive media, open television production, sociology, poetry, K through 12 education and activism and many, many more. I would love to invite them to join me on stage. Please welcome Eve Ewing, Jean Luen Yang, Violeta Ayala, Asia Bundawi, and AJ Christian. Welcome to you all. Thank you so much for being here. So let's talk about editing history. Toni Morrison referred to history as the master narrative. She said, quote, the master narrative is whatever ideological script that is being imposed by people in authority on everyone else. The master fiction, history. And for today, we're thinking of history as the agreed upon timeline of a society including the information that the governing feel compelled to act on, what information about what is happening even now gets added to the official story. So what I'd like to do is uh, introduce our panelists by asking them a question about their work, um, and which they will speak on for, for a few minutes. Then I'm gonna pose some questions to subsets of the panel. <laughs> Um, then we're going to uh, also invite you to submit questions using the, the submission boxes that are located around the room. Um, and I understand that we're working within time constraints, but uh, we're really excited about uh, this panel that we're really lucky to have here. So let's get started um, with Eve L. Ewing. Hello. Uh, you have written an acclaimed sociological book, Ghosts in the Schoolyard, Racism and School Closings on Chicago's South Side, and through your poetry books, including Electric Arches and the recent 1919, tell and retell the stories and histories of black Chicago, including the 1919 Summer of Racial Terror. With Marvel, you're best known for the Ironheart comic book series, but you've also done other comic book projects with them. And you teach at the University of Chicago, among many other affiliations and associations. So obviously, Eve, you're, you're famously multidisciplinary. Um, and recently, you told uh, Chicago Tonight on WTTW that you think of yourself as one person 
with a two-part project that has many different facets and parts. You said, quote, number one, asking critical questions about why the world is the way it is, about how we got to the histories we have, referring to your work, of course, as a scholar and sociologist, but also, quote, thinking about how we could imagine the world could be otherwise, referring to your works in, in comics and poetry. So tell us more about that intertwined relationship of, of questioning and imagining. Um, sure, well, thank you. First of all, thank you so much to Lauren, and thank you all for being here, and thanks to the fellow panelists. Um, you made me sound very accomplished. I feel like my greatest accomplishment today is getting into this chair, which was um, very challenging, but we did it, we made it, we're all up here. Um, hopefully we'll only get down of our own volition. Um, so I, you know, I think about my work um, in the long tradition of, of black art in America. And I think that um, I see myself as working in the legacy of many other inter interdisciplinary and kind of multifaceted <laughs> black artists and scholars. I think often about Du Bois, I think often about Zora Neale Hurston, right, as two examples who come to mind as a sociologist and an anthropologist that became very well known for writing other kinds of things. And so I, you know, I get asked questions about genre a lot and I'm always a little perplexed about how to answer because I see myself as working in a, a over a century old tradition. Um, but I also see the tradition of black art as being about what I would refer to as the double helix of joy and sorrow, right? So on the one hand, we need to, like, that's, that is what blues music is, that is what hip hop is, right? That's what um, so much black art is about, is about acknowledging fundamental sorrow in the world and then making something beautiful about that. And so that's kind of how I see my project with those two questions. On the one hand, I'm dedicated to being um, the kind of unapologetically downerish person on mo at most events and in most times when I'm talking, um, to just be the person who's like, well, our country was founded on the genocide of indigenous people and the institution of chattel slavery. And so then where do we go from there? And I think that poetry and comics become spaces where you can kind of imagine the world as it could be otherwise, and it doesn't cost you anything. You can just sort of write it into existence. So that's kind of how I frame my work. Thank you so much. Um, Jean, uh, your graphic novel, um, American Born Chinese, tells the story of coming of age as an Asian American, a child of immigrant parents in a society that uh, doesn't always award difference. And then uh, the incredible project Boxers and Saints is uh, told from two contrasting points of view. A uh, young man who joins the Boxer Rebellion uh, and then a, a young woman who's taken in by Christian missionaries at the same time. And you've, you've said that you decided <coughs> to tell that story as two graphic novel volumes because you couldn't tell who the good guys were and you wanted to provide both perspectives. And you've also taught high school computer science uh, for 17 years in Oakland, California. Um, your new graphic novel, Dragon Hoops, is coming out in March. Um, and the school journal calls it a mix of nonfiction, memoir, metafiction, and history. And for the book, you incorporate the real life stories of the high school students and teachers, uh, the, the high school basketball team at the school where you taught Bishop O'Dowd High School. Um, and you explore both the present and the past uh, through their stories. So how did you approach uh, basically telling these histories of real, real characters uh, in terms of this book, who you, you worked with and taught in the school? Well, well, first I want to echo Eve. Thank you all so much for being here. It's uh, an honor and a privilege to be here with you all. Um, I have two projects coming out this year. I did not mean for them to come out in the same year. It's just that I fell really behind on one of them. Um, and they're, they're both up here. The, the, the one on the right is Superman Smashes the Klan. It's about the Man of Steel fighting the Ku Klux Klan. And then the other one, uh, which Lauren asked about, is Dragon Hoops. So Dragon Hoops is my first nonfiction book. I don't know if you can tell from looking at me, but I am not a sports guy. <laughs> I was not very good at sports when I was a kid, and I never thought I would do a book about basketball. But then I used to teach at Bishop O'Dowd High School in Oakland, California. We have a renowned basketball team. Uh, I got to know the, the coach there who was an alum, and he told me this crazy story. He, he, when he was uh, a junior in high school uh, in 1988, he and his team went to the California State Championship. He was the backup point guard. He was on the court with seven seconds left. Somehow the ball finds his way to him. He puts it up at the buzzer. It goes in. They win by one, and everyone's freaking out. And then over the, uh, the loudspeaker, the refs announced that that shot was invalid because supposedly... Um, the center of the team had his hand on the rim. So he's like 40-something when he's telling me 
the story. And he hands me a DVD of that tape, right? And he goes, Gene, I want you to take this home and watch it. You tell me if that guy's hand <laughs> was on the rim. And I have to tell you, it, it's hard to tell. It's really hard to tell, right? So that was kind of the beginning. And, 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 um, and he eventually comes back to the school. He leads five different teams to the California State Championship. He has five chances to redeem this old hurt from when he was 17, and he loses all five times. So the, the year that I followed him, the 2014-2015 season, was supposedly his best chance at finally redeeming this old hurt. And I, wa I followed him because I wanted to find out if he did it, um, if he could do it. So he had, he had this, this kid on the team named Ivan Rab, who's now in New York. He was on the Knicks for a little bit. We're hoping he can get back on. He, he just got waived. But because of Ivan and, and, and some of the other players, that was supposedly his best chance. Now, I have to tell you, I was freaked out about doing this project because this is the first time that I've done a project about real people who are alive. I've done like historical pieces where there were real people, but they're all dead, so they can't complain, you know? <laughs> and these are real people who are alive. And, and ultimately, I think what I realized as I was going through that project was it's, it's kind of about relationship, you know? So um, I felt like with, with some of the students, um, or some of the, the players on the team who were students, if I didn't know them that well, I felt like I had to be really, really careful with their stories. If I knew them a little bit better, like one of them I had taught, um, I could have it back and forth about how he might be portrayed. And I felt like um, within the context of that relationship, I had a little bit more elbow room. And then Coach Lou, the coach, I'm pretty good friends with now. Uh, I felt like we, we had a lot of back and forth about how he was portrayed. My wife is in the book as well. Um, and, um, and I felt like I had a lot, a lot of... <laughs> Uh, leeway with how I portrayed her. But I did check. I did check. I promise I did check. Thank you so much. We're going to come back later to this question of um, the, the people who are no longer with us present. How do we tell their stories and how do we do justice to them yeah. as we look back? Um, thank you. Uh, we're going to go now to uh, Violeta Ayala. Um, Violeta, your documentary, Cocaine Prison, uh, follows Daisy, a Quechua teenager who's working to free her brother, Hernan, who has been arrested for a low-level cocaine trafficking and incarcerated in a notorious Bolivian prison. You're also working on a feature-length documentary about the disability rights movement in Bolivia, and you're developing a virtual reality project which explores the, the universal conditions that construct prison populations, no matter where you are in the world, related to um, the war on drugs. Um, and on social media, we've also been following you um, as you've been filming on the streets of Bolivia and in Australia, um, protesting against the inaction um, of governments in the face of wildfires that have spread uh, through Amazonia, now in Australia. So um, I want to ask you about something you told Remezcla when you were speaking about cocaine prison. You said, at some point, we had a lot of text for the film, a lot of statistics, a lot of things that would explain their point of view. Then I realized, this is ridiculous. This is a film from the inside. In any country in the world, filmmaking is elitist. So the majority of Bolivian filmmakers are white from more European backgrounds. So we are still a very colonized country, and it has to change. Our mentality has to find its own narratives, its own pace. So in thinking about that, that larger goal of decolonized narratives, how does that change happen? To begin with, I would like to pay my respect to the youth people in which land I'm standing on today. They were, are, and forever be the guardians of this land. I would also like you today to join me in solidarity to my First Nations brothers and sisters in Australia. As today, the white men celebrate Australia Day. They celebrate the destruction and death of their cultures. So I'll ask you for a moment, please. I feel that it's not a coincidence or a casualty that two places that are on fire are two places 
that have been pillaged, colonized, and they're also the heart of neoliberalism. I don't want to talk about colonialism as something of the past, because it's not the past. Colonialism is well and truly alive. What needs to change is not personal, it's a structural. We need structural and real changes in the way we live, in the way we see the world, in the way that we see politics. We need to be less afraid about if we want about looking at a future if we want to survive. Um, it's very hard to think when you think about film as one of the dominant narratives, but it still is just a tool. My people, I'm descendant of the people that have been here in this land for 26,000 years, continuously. It's remarkable, right? To think about it, that 500 years ago the white men arrived and look what they've done. And they even dare to say to us that we are not human enough, like Bolsonaro said yesterday. <laughs> they even dare to say that, that, they know that we are not human enough just yet. We've been seen as somehow subhuman. Yet, we have created a culture, we, are, we have created politics, we have created a way to see our own functioning nations. When the white men arrived in this land, this land was pristine. When I look at those mountains here, I imagine what we could have been. And I think this, we can't talk yet about decolonization because we're still talking about colonization. We're still being colonized. And film is a way that we're being colonized too. Now for me, it's a tool. I'm gonna use this tool and I'm gonna try to fight what I, I was told for what I'm finding myself as a Quechua woman. I'm gonna also talk about me as a person in this, discover, in this discovery, because I don't want my daughter to only have one side of the story. Um, can you imagine the first thing that I seen when I was little, it was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I was the Oompa Loompa. <laughs> I don't wanna be the Oompa Loompa no more. <laughs> And this is my personal resistance. This is my personal resistance of telling the story from one more side. But I also don't want to say I'll, I talked for all the indigenous people or all the Quechua people because I have the right to be myself. I don't want to fit in anymore because to fit in, I grew up wanting to fit in and I have to forget my own language, my own culture. I was embarrassed to say that I spoke Quechua. And I only spoke behind closed doors. And even today, in my country, in Bolivia, people are still embarrassed to speak Quechua, Aymara, and other countries, and other languages. So I think my work from now on, it is discovering that visual language, discovering the way I see the world and the way I feel the world versus everything that I've been told to this point. Thank you. Thank you. Asia, welcome. Your documentary, The Feeling of Being Watched, explores the FBI surveillance of your Bridgeview, Illinois community prior to 9-11, an operation that was codenamed Vulgar Betrayal. The documentary captures how you sued the Department of Justice to get the results from your Freedom of Information Act request related to this now closed investigation. You're still receiving more tens of thousands of pages of documents uh, related to the case. Um, and you're now working on a larger initiative beyond the film called the Inverse Surveillance Project, which you described to Filmmaker Magazine in this way. You said, Using artistic storytelling tools to exploit the tens of thousands of documents that the government secretly collected and maintained about your community for decades. 
You said this will, on one hand, hold the government accountable and compel transparency. On the other hand, it will also reappropriate and repurpose the secretly collected data to reframe the narrative about American Muslims and shape a beautiful and multifaceted story of this community. Um, so through your FOIA requests and your work, you are essentially creating a new public archive, um, one that was meant to be secret. So um, tell us about the role of secret archives, kind of making, making these clandestine actions more transparent in the way we think about editing history. Um, so surveillance is predicated on a violent one-way gaze. Um, it works um, when the person in the position of power is invisible and can do all of the seeing, and that the, pers the people that are being watched are um, absolutely exposed and not able to return that gaze, not able to see um, the surveiller. And the secret archive, as an extension of that physical surveillance, of the technological surveillance, actually um, you know, conducting these investigations over decades, um, generating thousands of records uh, about this information you've collected about people, um, and then making all of that classified, um, perpetuates uh, the violence of this surveillance. Um, and it also, you know, there's a there's a intrinsic relationship between um, truth and healing, and and I think also that like these secret archives, um, intentionally or unintentionally block the healing of our community because if you don't have access to the truth, if you don't know what happened, it's very hard to reconcile it. It's very hard to. Uh, just emotionally even process it. There's a relationship between these things. Um, and so the secret archive obstructs accountability. The secret archive, um, uh, you know, uh, continues the harm that has been done by the original act of the surveillance. Um, and it also, you know, it, it keeps this dynamic where uh, me as a surveilled person, people in my community, we're objects of information. You know, we're not agents who can look back. We are not subjects in communication. Um, it maintains us, the secret archive, as just objects of information, um, as uh, names on files, you know. Um, that's what it does. And uh, the idea of the inverse surveillance project is to disrupt that gaze, is to say, uh, no, we are subjects and we have agency too. And if we can't stop the surveillance, if maybe perhaps I, I will never be able to stop the FBI from surveilling my community, from surveilling me personally, I can disrupt that relationship by um, standing firmly in my agency and say, I have a gaze and I'm gonna use it and we're gonna watch back. And one of the ways um, I've done that is through the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, you know, the film premiered in 2018. I filed my lawsuit against the FBI in 2016 and I am still in court. Um, we had a big hearing just a few days ago in Chicago, actually, um, which was actually, you know, uh, pretty devastating. We had two FBI agents um, in court, uh, allegedly there to answer our questions about uh, the surveillance beyond Operation Vulgar Betrayal. What happened was uh, these investigations all started in the 90s. Um, you know, they thought all of our institutions, our mosques, our schools, our organizations of the immigrant Muslim community um, in Chicago's South Side were actually fronts for terrorism. And then uh, a lot of these investigations shut down in 2000. Then 9-11 happened, and they resurrected, like Frankenstein's, all of these investigations that targeted anybody who was Muslim or Islamic. Um, and they continue until this very day, okay? We're experiencing these sur the surveillance until this very day. And it was very, you know, um, it was very difficult to see FBI agents take the stand and repeat the narrative that we were here to keep the homeland safe, um, that 9-11 is somehow associated with my community. Um, that, that's why we had to resurrect those investigations. Um, even though these investigations failed, nobody was ever convicted of anything related to terrorism, they continue until today because 
the FBI has classified this history because they have kept this archive secret. And that's the relationship between history and the future, that if they can redact the story of what they did, they, if they can redact um, you know, the truth of this mass profiling campaign of the civil rights violations that happened, they can continue to say that these were successful and justify and um, project these uh, narratives and investigations into the future. And so the inverse surveillance project is, um, the idea is to disrupt that in the middle is to say that, no, actually finding out about our history and projecting our narrative into the redacted spaces is um, maybe what will keep us safer in the future. Um, that it's not just about um, storytelling, it's about also transparency, it's about holding accountable the government for what they're doing and saying no more. Um, and also that we're watching you watching us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, AJ, your research project, Open TV, uh, laid out a different future for what the creation networks and discovery mechanisms for independent storytelling could look like by telling the history of the rise of web series from the 1990s to today in a wonderful book, Open TV. Now you're an open television executive with OTV, your platform which has developed and distributed dozens of creative original series, including Brown Girls, Brujos, many, many more. And you also teach at Northwestern University. You've said that one of your goals with, with OTV is to develop intersectional content, a home for intersectional content, uh, noting that many of the identity-based channels uh, and platforms are, are limited to a single identity, um, and you're disrupting that. It's also, OTV is based in Chicago, um, and intentionally support Chicago-based storytellers. Uh, you've talked a, a great deal about the value of also creating local open television, supporting stories that, that, are, that are, do not have the, the need or the imperative to scale and, and reach as wide an audience as possible, which as we know is, is so often the, the, the center point or the obsession of the media industry. Um, so tell us, tell us about what it means to disrupt that obsession with scale through your work. Yes, um, thank you, and it really is an honor to be on the stage with people doing such groundbreaking work. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because the work I do and the work that really most of the artists in Chicago do is very low budget compared to probably anything that is screened at this festival. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, that kind of lower risk um, from the kind of investor side, right, really allows artists to tell the stories they want to tell in the way they want to tell it. Um, the history of television in the United States is not a story of artists having creative control over their stories or ownership of their stories. And yet, if you look at the history of just legacy television, even beyond the identity-based channels that we have, black and queer representation especially, but all forms of um, storytelling from non-normative people um, actually end up like reviving these brands and making them culturally relevant at moments of crisis, um, particularly moments where new media has sort of entered in, right? The um, rise of cable in the 80s coincides with the rise, and in the 90s, uh, coincides with the rise of black representation on broadcast TV because they needed something to make them relevant, right? And then when the internet came in the late 1990s and early 2000s, it was queer representation and then also black and Latinx representation, right, that made cable channels culturally relevant and helped them build stable audiences. So. For me, OTV, what we're doing is sort of trying to take that history and say, we've actually been contributing to this medium for decades and not having any say in how our stories are told. Um, and because I don't have a billion dollar investor, unless you're in this room, please come talk to me. Um, what I do is really just help artists tell their stories in the best way they can. Um, so, you know, someone comes to us and they say, I wanna tell this story about my community. And I'll say, that's great. Um, unlike most development executives who want to tell you no, or we can't do that, or that's not our brand, it's, our brand is open, we are open to all the stories, and it's just, you're in Chicago, you're intersectional, we're gonna try and help you as best we can. Um, and I think that that has done, over the years, some healing work um, from communities that feel like they have to curtail their story so that it can get to a big platform and reach millions of people and they can't tell it in the way that they want to tell it because that's too many people to consider 
you know, telling your story authentically. And, you know, whenever I sense that from artists, I'm just like, no, you need to stop thinking about everybody else and start thinking about who are the people that you want to hear this story, right? And um, what's gonna feel real to them? And I found that actually the artists that do that end up getting larger audiences sometimes, you know? Because we all know what a real story feels like. And we all know when a story feels like it's been kind of shaved off at the edges by executives to be palatable to a broader audience. Um, so I really think that that small scale space is a space of incubation and it's a space where you can plant that seed and really nurture it in the way it needs to be nurtured to set those strong roots. Um, and you know, I think some artists have used those roots to then grow and actually enter the mainstream and change uh, the big industry like the Brown Girls team, like um, Ricardo who's now writing for The Shy and so many others. Thank you so much. I should just point out that we have uh, Chicago representation on the panel from three of our artists. <laughs> Chicago all day, thank you. So um, thank you so much, each of you, for sharing your work um, in this way. You know, um, I'm struck by some kind of common themes, even though there's so many disciplines here. Uh, we're talking about, um, about healing, about the, the power that exists when you recenter who something is for, who something is by, who something is, is, uh, is created you know, uh, in, in the community of. Um, hearing uh, also an unapologetic uh, posture and, and recognition that um, you know, often when we think about marginalized communities, when we think about communities of color, we talk about it as a deficit lens. But I think what, what we need to realize more as a society is there's deep power, there's deep assets, there's, there's deep, deep resources that, that exist in the creativity and in the, the critical uh, intelligence and, and, uh, and the deep, deep roots of, 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 uh, of con communities not considered the mainstream. So, so now I'd love to turn, uh, turn to the panel and, and pose a few questions. And you know, uh, I think uh, these are all sort of touching on the theme of history, but but taking it in, in some other kind of cross-cutting cutting directions in terms of the the work that we've been hearing about. Um, so first, this I the idea of mythology, I'd like to speak talk talk about for a moment. So, it's mythology is one of the oldest uh, and the most epic histories of a lot of societies, but it's not viewed often as history, it's viewed as something separate, but some of the themes and the tropes uh, continue in a lot of the work. And so in particular, I wanna ask Jean and Violetta, uh, because in both of your works, you, you've explored mythology. Um, Jean, through your depictions of uh, Chinese mythology in both American-born Chinese and in boxers and saints, and Violetta, you're currently exploring a Quechua myth um, through the creation of the La Diablita story robot. Um, so I wanted to ask you both, how do you see these ancient storytelling forms as having a role when we talk about editing history? Um, so I, I, I do think um, mythology is just, it's an important part of every culture. Even, uh, you know, we think of American culture, as today's American culture is somewhat modern, but I really do think like what Marvel and DC are doing is actually just building a, a mythology for us. And often um, the mythology can get at a truth better than our real world uh, interactions, you know, or, 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 or our real world narratives. Uh, and, and I think it's because what's truthful ends up getting ramped up. The reason why, um, the reason why Superman and Batman and Spider-Man are dressed up in bright colors is because they are trying to ramp up a, a certain truth about how we live and, and, and who we are and how we move forward in the world. And I think the same can be applied to old, old mythologies. Um, Monkey King, which is one of the most famous of the Chinese mythological figures, he is almost always depicted in these bright, bright colors as a way of telling the audience, this is truth that is ramped up so you can see it a little bit more clearly. There is, a, there is an African team yeah, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. There is an African proverb that says that until the jaguar tells its own story, the hero will always be the hunter. <laughs> so that's what's happening, you know? And that's why for me it was important to reimagine and recreate what 
could have been if we told the story from our point of view. If we use what we have, that is a mixture, of course, of, of many cultures today, but we reinterpret in the way that we see it. We dare to challenge the narrative that they told us, and rather than, it's interesting because La Diablita, the devil, it's the representation of the white men for us, because they came, they said they came with religion, they told us um, that we are bad, we're gonna get punished, and they were bad, and they were ambitious, and they had big blue eyes, and that's the way that I, I see them when I was little. And that's why I wanted to to dare to question and to also have fun um, and also create superheroes a little bit because we need to have billions and heroes. I think racism is also to think that every indigenous person in this world is good. Of course no, we're good and we're bad and we make mistakes and I think part of this mythology is also um, to create our own heroes and do it on our own time and on our own visual language and start thinking about what means the most to us. For me, I believe that we don't own the land, but the land owns us. I think we are an integral part of this land where we live. And for me, it, was import it is important to have this representation of colors and textures and feelings. And in Prison X, I'm creating this with a group of Aymara women, um, another group of my country. Um, Maria is a fashion designer in Berlin, she's Aymara. And Rilda is La Emilia, um, she's, she says, I'm mestiza, mixed, because I'm Quechua and Aymara. <laughs> Uh, and she is the one who's creating the characters. And for me, it was very important to work um, with our own people. So I don't have to say, ex explain too much what I think or what I want. We all know what, in a little bit what we want and we invent together. And um, so I think that we are starting to create our own mythology. I don't think we, it's a, a door open for us. I think it's a little window that we are actually shaping, <laughs> trying to open with a, ourselves. I don't think yet we are there. Again, I'm, I'm talking about film as a tool, okay? But we've been waving for a very long time. We've been telling our stories through our language, through our crafting, to our <laughs> through our own ways that we've been passing our language. So this is just one part of a big landscape of how we're going to tell this story. My people are incredible in passing these stories. And so it's just, I'm just one person that works, that choose to work in this landscape. Thank you both. Um, it's so interesting you both mentioned this idea of superheroes as kind of the modern mythology. So I'd love to just turn for a moment to Eve because uh, you write the Iron Heart series, you've worked with Marvel as well. Can you, can you speak a little bit about the, the idea of the superhero and how, it's, how you see it functioning in this kind of work? Yeah, I mean, I, Jean said something that I very much agree with and that I, I say often, which is that, um, and, and it's part of how I've come to understand the work of writing superhero comics as being inherently political work. Mm -hmm. um, because when I first started doing it, I was like, this is a cool thing, that I, it's like a dream job that I, that I get to do on the side. Um, I grew up reading comics, and um, people sometimes ask, like, when you were a kid, is this something that you imagined? And the honest answer is no, because I had absolutely no model um, for what it looked like for a black woman to write comic books. Um, and so I, you know, I probably thought it was more likely that I would be like an Olympic figure skater or something than I, than, you know, which I also am not good at. <laughs> and so, um, but I, I think that I, so I, at first I was like, oh, this is a cool thing that I get to do on the side. And I was, um, very baffled as a, I'm a very, um, outwardly transparently political person. I'm very outspoken about my political ideas. And I was so surprised that at, at the level of, um, white supremacist and misogynist harassment that I received um, w before I even officially entered the comic industry when it was just rumored that I was going to be taking on these projects. And uh, a mentor of mine told me 
no, the reason that people are, because I thought, why is it that people are so angry about this thing, and they're not as angry when I go on Twitter and say we should abolish prisons, right? Or like America's cascading towards fascism, right? That, that, that's all fine to say, um, but if I write a pretend story about a 15-year-old girl that shoots laser beams out of her armor, that, that is really scary and bad to people. And the reason is because that these, these are our shared cultural mythologies. When I was a kid and I walked down the street in Chicago late at night, if, if I was coming home, and I look up at a building, and I, would, I would like to imagine for myself that it was that if I had just looked a second sooner, I would have just caught Batman's cape, right? Like just sweeping, if I had just looked up a second sooner, I could have caught him. And for, for our kids, for our collective kids, for white kids, to imagine that person as being Riri Williams, or as being Amadeus Cho, or as being Miles Morales, or as being Kamala Khan, right? For that to be the person that they imagine is coming to save them when they're afraid is um, deeply powerful, and it's insurgent against white supremacist American culture. Um, it's scary for little white kids to go to their parents and say that they want to be T'Challa for Halloween. Like, that is not a good look for white supremacy, right? Um, and so, <laughs> it's not good, it's not good. Um, and so I think that, you know, I do think very much that these are our, our shared mythologies and that's why the question of who gets to write them is so contentious in these, in these cultures. See also Star Wars, et cetera, right? Um, that's such a thank you so much to all of you for, for that. That's, um, that really resonates as well. So um, we've just talked about the, the, the larger than life, the mythological, the, the unapologetically creative um, and expansive. And um, now I'd like to ask you about that, the concept of, that might, many people might see on the other side, which is that of objectivity. Um, and you know, the way we consume history as people in the United States is that it's often painted as objective, you know. Um, so what, what do we think about the idea of objectivity um, held up by some as the gold standard in history and in journalism and in nonfiction storytelling? Um, but of course, you know, so much work nowadays and much of the work represented here challenges that. So I want to ask in particular um, Asia, Violeta, and Eve as nonfiction storytellers across various formats um, and Jean as well, you know, what, what do you think of this idea of objectivity? Bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again with the mic I on. said it, it's bullshit. <laughs> we, we have to stop using it as a standard, as a marker for anything other than uh, uh, reifying colonialism. Um, you know, this idea that a person who stands close to the story, who is in community, is, has no authority to tell a story, but somebody standing outside, on the outside looking in, usually male gaze, usually white, um, has mu much more authority to tell your story, um, is just about um, who, you know, saying who, sh who can tell stories and who can't, who gets a stage and who can't. I think a much more useful marker is transparency. I say like, um, let's start using transparency other th uh, instead of objectivity. So where do you stand? Uh, what's your positionality to the community you're telling a story about? What is the process that you took to get access into that community and to the characters you're talking with? Um, like, I think transparency about your positionality and transparency about your process is the most honest you can be. Um, and that objectivity is just um, a silly word that we've used to give certain people power to tell stories and to disenfranchise others. Yeah, ob objectivity is a lie be because since you were born, you're framed by, like, where you're born, like, like the culture that is around you, the people that are around you. So, objectivity is a lie. We are all sub subjective beings. So, how can we even, like, I, as you said, I think it's a tool to control us, to control, to give validity to our stories. Um, can you imagine, uh, like, at the moment, in Bolivia, we live in through hell and mess and everything, and so many people go and tell these stories, and they dare to say, even Naomi claimed dare to say things like, you don't know what's happening in your own country. I'm like, 
I don't know what's happening in my own country. I'm living it. I'm here in the streets protesting, giving my skin to what's happening. And you, you, because of your authority and your power, dare to say that I don't really know what's happening in my own country or in my own neighborhood. So objectivity, it's, it's a tool of oppression. It's something that we need to walk away and we need to forget it. We need to say, no, I have the right to tell the story as much as you do. And my daughter needs, and my daughter needs to hear the story from my side too. And you can keep telling me that I'm not being objective or which are is the other side of the story because there are hundreds sides of the stories. You know, like, like what I'm living here in this moment, you're living it in another way. Someone watching it is living it in another way. So we have such a different perspective. So I think transparency, perspective is very important. Being honest to what, being honest to yourself, critical thinking and critical questioning of yourself and from which position you are seeing this story and you are able to tell this story is more important than objectivity. Yes. Yeah, clap for that. Um, I couldn't agree more, and I think, you know, just to put my sociology hat on for a second, I think it's important to understand historically that many of the perspectives that we've been trained or told to believe are quote unquote objective are themselves deeply ideologically rooted. So even things like the biological sciences or the hard sciences or fields where people like to think that they're just reporting on objective, uh, indisputable fact. Um, tech, technology being, sorry Jean, technology being another example of this, right? We have come to understand the ways in which people's deeply ingrained ideologies about who a human is and what a human looks like and who and what is inhuman um, influence the ways that those structures work. I think all the way back to Linnaeus, right? The person who came up with the taxonomic, the taxonomic system that we now use to classify all life and biological creatures, right? And the thing they don't tell you in seventh grade is he, he did that for a racial hierarchy too, right? So he said, these are the types of humans, these are the species of humans, right? And created this kind of racialized hierarchy. Kant did the same, Hume did the same, Thomas Jefferson did the same. All the people that we think of as being architects of kind of rational Western thought were very much ideologically committed to this project of saying who and what a human was because it suited the things that they wanted to do in their lives. And so I think this idea of positionality is really important. And as a researcher, as a qualitative researcher, my job is to be transparent about the position through which I'm writing and to trust a reader to be discerning enough to make their own decisions about how that position may influence the, my truth that I'm telling. And I think that one of the uh, fundamental ways in which white male cis privilege, non-disabled privilege uh, manifests is that some people walk around with a body that they are told is unremarkable, while the rest of us walk around with racialized, gendered bodies, right? And so um, no one ever asks, uh, you know, a, a white male researcher, journalist, and so on, so, you know, don't you think that the fact that you benefit from the systems of power that you're writing about maybe biases you in the way that you're telling the story, right? And so those of us that are proximal in a certain kind of way um, are asked to be accountable for that proximity, but those that benefit from harm are never asked to be, uh, to be held accountable for that. They're not asked about that. One really kind of concrete example in, in journalism is um, the ways in, uh, the, the frequency with which journalists report police reports and police accounts of things without any kind of triangulation, without any kind of secondary source, right? So that if you see a report of a police shooting in the newspaper, most likely what you're seeing is what the police officer just told the reporter, right? And I'm not a journalist, but I've been told by journalists that the truism is supposed to be, if your mother tells you that something happened, you find another source, right? But when it comes to police reporting, that, that goes out the window because people want to maintain kind of proximity to the, the access that the police grant them and because we live in a society that tells us that police are infallible and they're endowed by the state with the right to murder people without sanction. Um, and we're not to question that. So that's kind of one concrete example, but that person never gets asked, you know, hey, do you think the fact that you live in a hyper-policed community that benefits from the exclusion of black people, uh, do you think that biases you in the way you're telling the story, right? It's only those of us who kind of wear our bot embodied racialization, gendered identities, queer identities, disabled identities, and so on, that are asked to account for that. And um, that is a kind of transparency that is unidirectional that I think is not fair.
Thank you. Um, so let's talk now for a moment about imagination. Okay. <laughs> That'd be good, right? Um, so E, Jean, and AJ, you all create and support work using mediums that, that I would say particularly lend themselves to vulnerability. Poetry, graphic novels, comics, and then web series, which can be very personal. Um, Eve, for your poetry book, 1919, you based it on the one eight, on the excuse me 800-page report called *The Negro in Chicago*, which was produced after the 1919 Summer of Racial Terror. Uh, so that work uh, is inspired by and rooted in archival. And Jean, when we spoke earlier, you mentioned that of, it's the case that that so many of the histories of marginalized people, of poor people, are not written down. Um, there is no written physical archive, and so because of that, through your work, uh, you've filled in some of the gaps, and you're, you're, you're considering how to do that. And AJ, uh, in working through OTV, you're creating spaces where web series creators can realize their wildest imaginations um, and not have to fit into to someone else's idea, a mainstream idea of what a narrative can be. So how do you all think about this, of, of, of the ways that you use imagination to fill in the gaps? and respond to and speak to what, what is a written history um, or a written system, kind of a, a set system. And, and how, do we, how do we think about taking chances in that context? Um, are there any rules that you, that you follow? Um, yeah, I think there's so many ways to imagine. And I think when I look at the site, I'm always bowled over by, you know, there's so many different kinds of people and they're all imagining in different ways. And, um, I think Brujos is an interesting example because Ricardo was really trying to flip the script on like the witch narrative in so much TV and film where the woman or person of color is the witch who's evil, right? And the white people are neutral, like afraid of them. And he, they flipped that immediately, right? Where it's like the gay Latinos are the good witches and the new world colonizers who are basically like white male scientists, thinking of objectivity, right, and myth, are actually the evil people who are like trying to take away this no knowledge and subjugate that knowledge. So sometimes it's very imaginative work. I mean, it's very hard to do fantasy on a low budget, um, but they really pulled it off. Um, but I also think, for me, like one of the rules I follow by is like, we imagine collectively, we imagine as communities, we don't just imagine on our own, we need other people to sort of support our imaginations, to inspire us, and you know, thinking about film production, everyone here knows this, to actually do the work of creating the, the new imagination, right? Um, so, you know, both for OTV as a platform, I have one of my collaborators, Stephanie Jetter, in the office, in the, in the audience who's uh, running the OTV studio, and some of my writers and collaborators are in here, and some of the co-producers like Troy Pryor, right? Like we all together are trying to imagine a different industry, trying to imagine television where intersectionality is not perceived as marginal, but actually is central, which it absolutely is to how we have to understand ourselves as a human race to survive this planet, right? If we continue to marginalize and subjugate people because they're different, we're frankly killing the planet. We're, you know, we're killing the planet in very material ways. Yeah, I think imagination is like my my key, my guiding word, you know, and I think that there's a way in which that can feel sort of light and fluffy. You know, I write about time travel, I write about superheroes, I write about flying bicycles. Um, but I actually think of it as also, again, like a, a deeply insurgent idea because for me, imagination is foundational and a necessary prerequisite for any political transformation. And so, like, in the time of Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, people lived in a world where the entirety of the social, political, and economic edifice of everything they knew as reality depended on the enslavement of people, right? And they had ne literally never seen anything else. And nevertheless, had to imagine a world where something else could be. A world that people told them was impossible, a world that was evidenced as being impossible by everything that they could observe, right? Only imagination, uh, only imagination allows us a way out of that. Um, and so that's why I identify as an Afrofuturist. That's why I, I think of imagination as this kind of critical first step. Um, so, you know, 1919 is a little bit of a different project because I'm imagining backwards. Um, although I, I don't believe in linear time, which is also part of my, like, Afrofuturist practice, so we can, I'm writing a different book about that that you can all read in the far future. Um, and so, so my first book, Electric Arches, I say these are true stories from the past and future, right? Like all of these things 
happened are happening and continue to happen. And I think with 1919, so for those of you that aren't familiar with the project, um, uh, which is probably all of you, um, the, so in 1919, uh, as part of the Red Summer in Chicago, there was this, um, this violent race riot, racial terror is, no, is another great way of describing it. And um, 58 people died, um, the majority of whom were black people killed in random acts of violence by their white neighbors. And um, I was really stunned to realize how little I knew about that event and how little most Chicagoans and most people around the world knew about this event. As, and I started to think about the ways in which um, it was very embodied in the places that I frequent. So people were murdered in cold blood by strangers on corners that you and I and other Chicagoans in the audience have, have walked on. And, um, and so I wanted to be in conversation and do right by these people who were murdered that I see as my neighbors, right, my neighbors across time and space, and to uh, use imagination to tell their story in a way that was, um, that was fuller and more three-dimensional than you know, a two-line sentence in a report saying that a black person was stoned to death or stabbed to death or beaten to death on the street. And I thought that that would be a small way of, uh, of paying homage to them and also recognizing that that story is not past. That, that you know, the, the, the riot began when Eugene Williams, who was a 17-year-old black boy, is murdered, right? And so the book is about Eugene Williams, and it's about Emmett Till, and it's about Laquan McDonald, and, 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 and. Um, and I think that in the absence of other kinds of written records, imagination becomes the only way um, you know, and I'm trying to like kind of reappropriate the word empathy, which I think has been weaponized against people of color um, since the Trump administration began to basically say like we should have empathy for people who are invested in our deaths. Um, so I'm trying to reappropriate that and and reclaim, take empathy back, right? And um, so for me, imagination is this kind of deeply empathic process of saying, how can I tell a story about this person who is my neighbor who's gone, uh, who, whose story I believe deserves to be told? The, the reason I asked that uh, question that you um, have in your question is because of Boxers and Saints, which is a two-volume graphic novel that I did in 2013. Uh, it's about the Boxer Rebellion, which is an actual historical event that took place in China in the year 1900. There's a war that was fought between China and the colonial powers, and nobody really knows how the Boxer Rebellion started because it began with the poor, and people just don't record the history of the poor. So there are lots of theories about how it started. Uh, and, and because it's um, historical fiction, I needed to figure out where the history ended and the fiction began. Ultimately, I think I came up with this rule where um, you know, I could make stuff up as long as it was rooted in something real. So for instance, early on in the Boxer Rebellion, um, there was this uh, traveling kung fu master that would go from village to village. No one's totally sure if he was part of the beginning of the, the, the Boxer Rebellion, but he might have been. And his name was uh, Big Belly Lee. Yeah. And there was, <laughs> yeah, and he had a big belly, which was really weird because people <laughs> were starving in the Chinese countryside, right? So, so people were like, how does this dude have a big belly? <laughs> and the theory that they came up with was, well, he has a mystical eye where his belly button's supposed to be. So I use that. I use that as the basis of something that I made up. And it's, it's so beautifully, beautifully done in the book. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, I'm conscious of the linear time that they tell us that we're, um, <laughs> we're subject to for today. Um, I also wanted to remind you, invite you to submit any questions that you might have. Um, but at this point, I'd love to turn to the, our big question that brings us all here today, this, this question of editing history. Let's, do, let's go back, let's, let's get specific. Let's, let's, we've already talked a bit about it, but let's do a little more editing. Um, Asia, earlier uh, you pointed out this, this idea, this really, this really interesting idea that uh, we're so familiar in terms of the stories Hollywood tells about time travel. In terms, it's very, it's surgical, it's strategic. We gotta go back, we gotta stop this one thing, but we gotta be, we don't wanna, we don't wanna cause the ripple effects. You know, we, we, we wanna be, we gotta go in and, and change it, but, but in terms of the implications of, of changing some things of the past, or in, in our case of what we're gonna talk about, highlighting things, underlining things of the past, you know, um, passing out information about things in the past. What we do want those ripple effects. That's exactly what we are talking about in terms of reclaiming history, retelling narratives. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, Eve, also going back to something that you shared on Chicago Tonight, you said people make these histories. They didn't just happen. And therefore, we have the power to unmake them. So let's spend our remaining time together talking about this. How would you edit history? How would this cause ripples that would change the present or reimagine the future? Asya, will you start us off? Sure. Um, thank you for the provocative question. Um, well, I'll, I'll talk specifically about um, the, the FOIA documents that I'm dealing with um, and the Inverse Surveillance Project. So, you know, I won 33,000 pages uh, of documents about surveillance of my community that the FBI was ordered to process. Of the 33,000 pages, they redacted in full 20,000 of them. Um, of the 10,000 I do have, they're full of redacted space, black and white holes all over the documents um, where information has been disappeared entirely. Um, and so as a journalist, I was extraordinarily frustrated with this. Like, what, what do I do with this, you know? Um, and it was clear that the, the way I could deal with it emotionally, I could deal with the angst of seeing this narrative of, my whole, of all of us being a bunch of terrorists repeated over and over again in the documents, was to treat it artistically. And so I started thinking about how do we project meaning into the redacted spaces? And um, that's what the Inverse Surveillance Project is about, where on one hand, using artificial intelligence um, to try to imagine what is behind the redacted space. And the way we do that is, you know, um, the FBI has surve been surveilling communities of color since they started, um, you know, uh, so we have hundreds of thousands of pages of records about COINTELPRO, uh, about the surveillance of the Black Power Movement, of the Puerto Rican Independence Movement, um, you know, of the American Indian Movement in this country, and tactics that have been used over and over again in these communities. And so, you know, that's our data set, is uh, the, the stories, the documents of other communities of color that the FBI has collected to try to imagine what's behind the redacted space. And then it's also like these documents tell a story of my whole community, right? Of my whole neighborhood. Um, at one point I found my father's name unredacted in the file. It's uh, one of three names I've ever found unredacted in there. And, um, and it's, so this is the story you've told about us. What does it mean to reclaim it and superimpose our own story on it? Um, and that has to be done in community, right? If we were collectively traumatized by this thing, then actually we need to collectively heal from it, and that's done, I think, by reclaiming these records. So uh, we're working on a co-created project in Chicago, in Bridgeview, in the community, um, where we invite everyone uh, to come. And you know, the FBI used these documents to paint a picture of a massive criminal network. Um, but actually what they were looking at was a network of community. Yeah, we're all related and connected to each other, and this person borrowed money from that person because he married her cousin, <laughs> and you know they started a store together, and this is what a network of community looks like. So we're asking people in the community to come, and all of their names have been redacted from the file, and to say, record your name, and we're cross-stitching, literally, our names into the record, and showing the lines of relationships between us. You know, this person married that person, I went to school with that person, every family name and every name that's in there is connected to the other. And this large web of community is going to be, you know, superimposed on, the, on these documents. So I think um, that's how we edit history. You know, um, the information that's been disappeared from us, um, we can give meaning to the re redacted space with our own stories and to say, you know, while you were watching us and thinking we were up to this, this is what we were actually up to. We have home videos, we have our own family archives that we're also using to put into that redacted space um, and to reclaim these documents and, you know, to say, you know, they were done violently, but we're gonna take this archive and we're gonna use it to, to tell another kind of story. And we're gonna do that, we're gonna edit that history also to say, you know, even if you win in the courts, even if you win in policy, like we're gonna win in the art museums, we're gonna win in our community, we're gonna win in the streets, that we have culture still, that, uh, and we're gonna use that to retell these stories. Um, you really make me think about just the empower of tell the power of telling history from those who are subjugated by people in power. I just think, you know, when, before I started OTV, I was super inspired by this show called Soul. Um, 
that ran from 1968 to 1973. It's one of the first black, if not the first black produced TV show, nationally syndicated, created by a black gay man named Ellis Hazlip. It's a fantastic documentary called Mr. Soul, doing the rounds right now about this. And when I saw that, and I saw that there was this show 50 years ago that was produced by black people with only black people in the audience and had like poetry and dance and theater and every other art form you can imagine on TV. I was blown away and I was a little angry that I'd never been, I'd never heard of it before. Um, and so it really just motivated me as a black queer person to be like, we have to write our own histories and throw them out there, right? And tell our own communities that we actually do write our own stories. We have our own network. We have our own systems of support that might not be valued by people in power, but actually have tremendous power in and of themselves. Um, it's something I did a little bit in my book, you know, when I was writing, interviewing web series creators, I was discovering these folks, you know, in 2010, 2011, folks that have since become famous, like Issa Rae and, um, you know, the team behind Broad City and so many other people who you might not know, but please bring my book so you know them. Um, <laughs> and at, once I got, like, past, like, 50 or 60 interviews, I realized that I was telling a history, even though I was writing it in the present, and that someone was going to pick up this book 20 years from then and say, oh, wait, there was this whole movement to transform television and make it community-based, um, and who knows, 20 years from now, that might not be possible, and that might encourage them to do it again. Um, and so I just think, you know, I really s ended up centering that book on women and people of color and queer people because it just seemed like that just mattered so much more to the industry, even though there were plenty of people making web series. Um, and it's something I feel like we're doing through OTV right now where hopefully we can archive the website somewhere and put, someone can look and say, oh wow, in Chicago, there were you know, stories about queer disabled people and undocumented Latinx people and black women all like in conversation and they all supported each other and worked on each other's projects and they all helped each other tell those stories. I think that is very, very important when we talk about Latinos to look at ourselves and know who we are. We are put all in a bag. Huh? <laughs> and we don't recognize that white Latinos are the ones in power and who keep dominating our lives. And then they come, they, they still get all the right to tell the story and they get... Um, not just resources, but also legitimacy. But being legitimate, legitimate doesn't mean that you're right. You're still framing us. We're still the other, and we're still, in a way, the majority with a little voice in Latin America. Most of people who look like me, w like two million Bolivians live in Virginia, and they wash dishes and work in construction, because that's what they imagine they could be. If I could re-edit the story, and I'm doing it because I'm a maker, <laughs> Because I do it every day. I imagine myself every day when I go to the streets and protest in Bolivia, when I go to the streets and protest in Australia, when I raise my hand to say something, when I draw, when I, when I document, when I write a story on Instagram or in, or in Twitter, I'm reimagining myself. And I will just ask everybody, to everyone in my community, to take a deep breath, to look at the sky and think, what if this moment that I was living, it, it's passed to me in, not, in a non-linear way, but in a spiritual way? What if you could feel the spirit that you walk next to you and stop, stop coming up with an answer? There are no answers. We are start asking those questions today. So, like the story that I know about colonization is from the point of view of Simon Bolivar that is the hero, but it's the hero of the white people. Like our heroes have been totally erased. So we need to go back and look into these little lights that we have and then think about what, how I would act it in this moment in time, and then I'm gonna write this character as if the way that I would have acted, because my consciousness and the way that I describe and I see the world is also a way that was passed to me for 26,000 years, ancestor to ancestor to ancestor. So rather than trying to look 
for answers outside myself, I'm gonna try to look for answers inside myself. And I will try to tell the stories of Tupac Katari and Tupac Amaru and Inti and Kilia from our point of view. And I will ask everybody to stop funding and stop telling that it's better that someone else tells the story. It's not better because we're going to find our way, our own pace. We live in a different, we live a different story. So when they said to me, oh, but it's, some, it's better that Mel Gibson did Apocalypto. No, it's not better because he's, he's actually framing my story. He not just colonized me, he, like, his people not just destroy everything that we were. Now they come in to tell me how I felt. <laughs> come on. <laughs> like, stop, stop that, because that's really damaging. Let us come to the place that we have to be on our own pace. And we're gonna come, and we're gonna do it. But stop recolonize, stop co keep colonizing those spaces and think about it. Be responsible for your actions too when you choose to support a person that's gonna tell me how I should feel, how I should be, how my story should be told. We will tell it, and it's going, at the moment we're fighting for survival, you know? And because if we lose this fight, because if we lose this fight about climate change and climate emergency, my people are the ones who are gonna go down first. So this is the fight that we cannot lose. That's why we're so close to the earth. That's why I spent the last year in the streets shouting, protesting, trying to stop the development, keep going, trying to stop selling meat to China uh, in massive quantities because I think that what is personal is political, but it was also by myself doesn't matter. For me to create a loan is not important. I want all my people to be at the same level as me in every single way, not just in film or in uh, virtual reality. No, I just want them to be in equal terms so we can sit down in these panels and talk eye to eye without having to feel we're always complaining. I don't like to complain anymore. <laughs> I, wanna, I really want to enjoy life because I think that we deserve it. Uh, I, I think if I could edit one thing out of American history, it'd be the, the model minority myth. I've uh, done a deep dive on uh, post-World War II America, uh, in part because I was working on Superman Smashes the Klan, which is set in 1946, and I became really convinced that um, that, that was the beginning. That was the beginning of the, of the model minority myth. You know? uh, and, and I think this, this myth that you know, Asian Americans, and specifically East Asian Americans, came to America, worked hard, achieved the American dream, um, it's, uh, there's a cost to it. I think most of us, most Asian Americans, have internalized that. And there's a cost that we don't realize that we are incurring. So for example, just one thing that's very, uh, very personal to me as an Asian American guy, is people don't realize this, but at the turn of the century, in like the 1900s, you know, in Chinatown, um, the, the Chinese men in Chinatown were kind of seen as sexy. Like, there was this huge influx of these young, white uh, missionaries who would go in there, and then all their churches would be really pissed off about it. Because a lot of them would start dating these Chinese guys. You know what I mean? And, and, uh, and, and back then, the stereotypes were that uh, Chinese, Chinese men were, um, were uh, genetically criminal, that we were unpredictable, you know, but that also we were kind of sexy. Uh, and, then, and then this all flips, this all flips in World War II. And in World War II, what happens is that America realizes that China is our greatest ally against the empire of Japan. And all these stereotypes shift. We go from being genetically criminal to genetically hardworking and loyal. Uh, and then at the end of World War II, Chinese Americans are actually allowed to move into white neighborhoods. But that comes with a cost. The cost is, you know, it's fine for that Chinese family to move next door as long as they don't marry your daughter, as long as they don't, they don't date your daughter. So then, then all, that, all that sexiness, all that Chinese sexiness gets kind of <laughs> drained away from, from, the, from the narrative that America tells about Chinese Americans. Eventually, in part because uh, America has a hard time telling the difference between Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans, that, that idea gets spread all around. So it encompasses all Asian Americans. And I, I just think a lot of us, 
um, who believe in this idea that you know we've whatever we've achieved is purely because of hard work. It's not because of a narrative shift that dates back to World War II that we've lost something without realizing it. Um, I didn't mean to be the last person. Yikes. Okay. Um, so I think that uh, I feel that we are all editing history every day because of the whole nonlinear time thing, but specifically because we are, um, as Violeta said, we are living in a past at all times. So we are living in the past of those who are to come after us, to whom we should all be accountable, even though we've never met them, and for the most part, we'll never meet them. And we are all living in a dystopian future, like right now. Mm -hmm. And so um, given that, I think a lot about, I think that Americans have developed um, a complicated relationship with despair, especially white Americans, again, like since 2016, because I think it's very easy for people who haven't been in struggle for a long time to be very despairing at this particular political moment that happens to be more legible as disastrous, mm -hmm. even though we've all been living through constant disaster all the time, right, since the onset of colonialism. Um, and so in that moment, it's very easy for people to be like, I just give up, it's so hard, we're all doomed, right? And the thing is, is that um, we're only doomed if you view success as meaning that you expect to achieve transformative justice in your own lifetime. Um, we're only doomed if you buy into a hyper-individualistic American society that says that, you know, a hero is supposed to come along and save the day and, like, Martin Luther King fixed racism, that one, you know, and the stuff like that. If you buy into those kinds of narratives, then, yeah, we're doomed. But if you see our struggle as collective and as spanning generations, I know that I am deeply grateful and everything I do is made possible by the work of people like Ida B. Wells, like Audre Lorde, like Ella Baker, who could never have fully understood all that they've given us within the span of their lifetimes, right? And so the way I understand it is that I'm trying to pick up on the work of people who came before me, who already did a lot of things and left them for me and peaced out, right? And my job is to do what I can do in the very limited time that I'm on this earth and then I'm gonna die, right? And then my job is to have left the work so that the generations who come after us don't have to reinvent the wheel and they can pick up from where I left off. And so that, to me, what e is what editing history means. It means doing the work right now um, to try to make something a little less garbagey for the, po the people <laughs> that, are, that we have yet to meet and that we will never meet. And to understand this struggle as being an intergenerational struggle that far supersedes any one superhero individual person. Yeah. I would like to say one more thing. I think that it's also, when we talk about diversity, Diversity doesn't mean to have people of different shapes and colors telling the same story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important, don't confuse diversity with assimilation. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that, that we have a different ways to see the world and we have to find a way that we express this way, mm -hmm. these ways to see the world. And I've been, used the wor I've been seeing the, the use of the, words, the word diversity far too often and it's losing its meaning. Yeah. Diversity is becoming a neoliberal world, a globalized world. And I've seen some people saying the same thing, it doesn't matter the color of their skin, and that's not the point. We really need to think about it. Diversity doesn't mean different skin colors. Diversity means that we accept that we are all different, but we all value the same. But we're all different, ac accepting those differences. In a way of even in, in an industry point of view, networking. I hate networking. I, talk to, I like to talk to people about their lives. I want to know if they have children, how they feel, if they're cold. I don't know. I don't <laughs> care about what they, like, I'm sorry, but I hate this word networking, seen as a, as a way always business. What is business? What is money? Look, we are burning. The world is burning. And, you know, we're not going to drink money. This green dollars is, is not going to worth nothing. But as Eve said, like, you know, I hope that I don't, I hope that my daughter, my granddaughter will feel as proud as I do as I feel about my grandparents and my mother. That's all that matters to me. On that note, I think uh, I'd like to ask you all and join me in thanking this wonderful panel, Eve, Jean, Asia, Violeta, AJ, and thank you all for being here. <laughs>